We're live. We're live, Odin. Odin, you are live. Oh, I can hear you. Good day, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. This is the second webinar in this series. My name is Audrey Okonkwo. I'm a public policy professional and co-founder of IDEV Africa, and I'll be moderating this session. Thank you for joining us as we discuss the future of social protection in Africa. In today's webinar, we will discuss the challenges, successes, and prospects of social protection policy. I would like to thank our expert panelists for accepting to participate in this discussion despite their busy schedules. I appreciate your generosity. This webinar is a partnership between the African Studies Center at the UNC Chapel Hill, UNDP Africa, and IDEV Africa. IDEV Africa is a nonprofit championing innovative approaches to Africa's development. We focus on delivering practical and innovative solutions to real life problems using systems thinking, technology, and community development, community involvement. Sorry. So before we dive in, I'd like to take a moment in acknowledgement of the events of the last two weeks. It's been a heavy time for a lot of us here in Nigeria as we have witnessed an increase in gender-based sexual violence. The rape and murder of Uwa, Jennifer, and a number of other girls and women has been nothing short of heart-wrenching. Rape is criminal and unjustifiable. The rape culture is a pandemic that should concern everyone, irrespective of their gender. I use this opportunity to salute everyone who has and continues to use their platform online and offline to fight this horrible pandemic. Some progress has been made, but there's still a lot of work to do. To dismantle the systems that support rape culture and strengthen those that ensure victims get justice. We say no to rape. Before we get, begin, a few housekeeping items. Each panelist will respond to a set of questions from me. Then we'll take audience questions at the end of all the presentations. Please use the Q&A box to send in your questions. The Q&A feature is at the bottom of the control panel on your screen. At the end of the presentation, the panelists will respond to the question as time permits. For questions to be answered, you would get would, um, the panelists will type in the answers and will publish them to the audience. This webinar is being recorded and we'll share a link, a replay link, along with summary of the key points after the event. So if you register for the event with your email, you'll get a copy of this link. Now let's go to the agenda of the day. The need for countries to have a cohesive social protection framework is more urgent than ever. When crises strike, the poor and vulnerable are the hardest hit. The COVID-19 crisis has had both economic and social impacts on the poor and the vulnerable. And since the pandemic hit, countries all over the world have introduced social protection measures to cushion the negative economic impacts the lockdown restrictions and forced closures have had on their citizens. The World Bank estimates that the pandemic could push about 49 million people into extreme poverty in 2020. A large share of the new poor will be concentrated in countries that are already struggling with high poverty rates. Almost half of the projected new poor, about 23 million, will be in sub-Saharan Africa. In Africa, social protection policies are relatively new in most countries. The COVID-19 pandemic has led to job loss and loss of income for many. Governments are now faced with the challenge of extending palliative measures to the new poor segment of the population who are casualties of the pandemic. Our first panelist, Yowa Apera, is the national coordinator of the Social Safety Nets program in Nigeria. Prior to his current appointment, Apera was national program manager of the Child Development Grant Program at Save the Children, Nigeria. Apera has over 28 years technical and managerial experience across diverse sectors, including social protection and governance. Since the Safety Nets program kicked off in 2016, it has disbursed conditional cash transfers to about 11 million people 
um, approximately 2.6 million people. I met Apera when I worked as social protection advisor at the Imo State Governor, and my program was directly under his oversight at the federal level. Apera, my first question to you is, in view of the COVID-19 pandemic and an emerging new poor segment of society, how does the National Social Safety Nets Office intend to, intend to extend coverage to those who are not formally deemed eligible for social assistance, particularly those in the informal sector? The second question is, can you please speak on the challenges your office has faced in distributing cash transfers to beneficiaries in remote areas? Okay, thank you very much uh, and uh, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for this um, brilliant opportunity uh, to uh, rub minds together uh, on the future <coughs> of protection as the main strategy and driver of um, alleviating um, of the poverty um, of our citizens, um, not only in Nigeria, but in Africa. And also uh, for us in Nigeria, but particularly this uh, resonates with the presidential ambition of lifting 100 million Nigerians out of poverty in 10 years. And the federal government started this um, efforts towards living the, lifting 100 million people out of poverty in 10 years by establishing what we now have as a National Social Safety Net Coordinating Office, Abuja, which um, I sit and preside over, uh, to, amongst other things, uh, establish the National Social Register, working with the various state governments, 36 uh, state governments and the FCT, but also lead on social protection policy cohesion uh, building blocks um, and systems, including policies um, and structures for effective social protection implementation, coordination, and management in the country. Uh, to do this, we, will, of course, worked with a number of um, partners, uh, MDAs, as we all know, social protection is multi-sectoral, and some of the efforts of the partners and other MDAs also led to the uh, approval of the social protection policy for the federal government of Nigeria in 2017 that the president signed it, uh, the policy after the FEC approved that. This policy is of course up for review this year. So this conference would have come at a better time, um, which I'm very sure a lot of my colleagues are also online and some of the contributions made here will also directly or indirectly uh, impute into the review of that policy. That said, I would like to then come down to your question. Um, at the start of the pandemic, um, the social register as read out by the president, uh, Mohamed Buhari, um, early, March, uh, early April uh, showed that the social register was 2.6 million poor and vulnerable households across 34 states of the Federation and the FCT um, and individuals 11 million. The Mr. President then gave a directive to up those numbers very rapidly and quickly um, to 3.6 million, but also beyond. Now, as soon as that directive was received, um, the Honorable Minister of Humanitarian Affairs, which uh, I report directly to, um, extended that directive from Mr. President for the rapid expansion and provided the needed support to do that. Now, to do this, we did set up not only to rapidly expand the social register as we currently have it through um, the community determining the poor and vulnerable through a targeting mechanism called a community-based targeting system. But also we started uh, work on design of what we call the COVID-19 rapid response register. Um, so the social register as it is of today has grown to 3.6 million poor and vulnerable households uh, made up of 15 million individuals across 36 states of the Federation and the FCT. At the start, two states were not yet on the National Social Register, which was a Bonyan Ogun state, but today all those states are in. And so that is increasing. 
We have uh, a, a directive from the, um, the minister uh, to continue efforts on building the social register, but also on the rapid response register that speaks to uh, also your, your, your second half of your question around the informal sector. The rapid response register is targeting primarily the urban poor, semi and peri urban poor, and mostly individuals in the informal job sector who are vulnerable or likely to slide into poverty as a result of the pandemic. Now, the MBS re uh, recent report through the National Living Standards Survey puts Nigeria's absolute poverty figure at 4.0. 40.1%, uh, that translates to about 9 million individuals. Projection shows that in the next uh, two, three, four, four years or so, uh, that figure is going to move from the 40.1% to 45%. Now, this is huge numbers and very scary um, in terms of uh, the results or what this is about. So the federal government is then using effectively the strategy of increasing these numbers and these registers to target the poor and vulnerable. And how are we going to develop the rapid response register? The rapid response register is going to be developed uh, through uh, the use of um, um, a number of um, mechanisms. Uh, first, we're using the NLSS results by the MBS that was just recently re uh, um, released to uh, map effectively or design an algorithm that will speak to the proxy mean testing equation that will provide an effective means of um, interacting with the various databases that we have and will be open to from community-based uh, organizations who have been involved in working with the informal sector and the poor and vulnerable in the country. Um, also the database from the telcos, the banks, um, to then synthesize this data and narrow down to um, those poor and vulnerable who are affected in one way or the other or impacted in one way or the other by the pandemic uh, through the loss of their regular income and so rendered poor, to then go back into the field, then find these individuals to validate their information and record them or register them onto the rapid response register. So in terms of your ask around how do we intend to expand these numbers, in summary, in two ways, through the horizontal and vertical expansion of the national social register, through the community-based targeting system that we are operating and the register is going daily, but also through the development of the rapid response register that is targeting primarily uh, the urban, semi and peri urban poor, who, of course, majority are in the informal job sector. So, your second question around challenges uh, for pain, uh, particularly in the rural areas. We suffer from a debt of infrastructure um, in the country, particularly. around financial instruments. Um, we, uh, we have a directive from the Honorable Minister Sadio Mafarouk to quickly digitize the current ca cash transfer as far as possible, uh, which we are doing right now, but also uh, working with other relevant partners to see how we extend digital payments to the last mile to the rural uh, populace. The good news is that they are emerging very strongly um, agency network for mobile money in the country. And we are, we are working towards leveraging on those structures to extend cash transfer to the poor and vulnerable, even in the rural areas. So I'll stop here. Um, and then I would, uh, I'm sure I'll have a chance to entertain questions and also um, to thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Apera, for that very useful insight. Um, it's, I'm really glad to know that existing databases are being put to good use because um, the COVID pandemic has made it really critical that coverage be extended. Um, the former figures were really low compared to the number of already existing poor people we have in Nigeria. So um, hearing that work is being done to extend coverage even beyond 
the social register and beyond, you know, what we have. And even using algorithms to be able to synthesize the poor people who, um, in the informal sector is really important and is very, very useful um, insight to have at this time. So um, now, um, from your, from Mr. Perra's contribution, we can see that expanding social protection in African countries um, can be hindered by the weak identity management systems that fail to capture the informal sector. And as it seems, the work to capture the informal sector is being done at this time that the pandemic is already taking place. This leads me to um, our second panelist, Ms. Sheila Nkonika, who has worked extensively in, on social protection in Africa, particularly Zambia. She's worked with the government and CSOs and also the United Nations. She currently works as the senior social protection expert at Save, Save the Children Nigeria. And in her role, she provides technical oversight for the implementation of Save the Children's social protection portfolio in Nigeria. Save the Children does a lot of work in Jigawa and some other northern states. Sheila, from your experience of working in developing countries, how would you advise governments to tackle the coverage of the informal sectors in countries with weak or non-existent identity management systems? Secondly, can you please share some of your experience of using social protection programming to promote social inclusion and address gender disparities? So thank you very much uh, for those questions. You need definitely some very uh, vital questions, especially in this era. What COVID-19 has done is really speed up the work that needs to be happening currently in social protection. So the first issue that you spoke about, and I think a pair touched on it, is the fact that um, the pandemic has shown us really how uh, poverty is distributed across Africa and across different developing countries. So we find that most of our social protection programs focus for, on those people we deem as poor and vulnerable. So those are the really extremely poor and vulnerable. There's not so much that is covering the middle. So these are the ones that are mostly in the formal sector and they are really around that poverty line. So with any eventual shock that comes in, these people find themselves in, uh, in, extreme, in extreme poverty. But as you said, uh, currently, for most African countries, I think as the experience is in Nigeria, as uh, Apera said, there's very um, limited coverage of, of, of this particular group. But apart from that also, in a lot of countries, there's the weak uh, identification, identification systems. So with the identification systems, I think there are two problems we need to be aware of. So the first thing, which is more concerning, is the exclusion. So sometimes when we narrowly target for it, for instance, and just say those people who have maybe specific IDs or are registered as part of social registers, I think which are coming up in Africa, there would be possibilities of that exclusion. So a lot of people might be excluded. So those that are most in need, that do not necessarily have access to social services and registration might be, um, might be excluded. The second point is the inability to verify identities. So that is a serious issue. And this causes a lot of leakages. And I think the leakage is a very big concern for a lot of programs because again, it prevents support from reaching the people that actually, that actually, actually need it. So going forward, I think there is a big case to really invest in uh, identification and vital registration systems. But speaking at the moment, I think there are a lot of countries, there are a lot of partners working in this area. I'm aware of the World Bank in my country, Zambia, that have been supporting the whole vital registration and ID system here in Nigeria as well. There are programs around that. But in terms of the immediate needs that we need to do, I think Apera touched on this. So I think there are a lot of opportunities out there to use existing databases. But then we need to understand that when we're talking about coverage and people that are not usually covered, they are not homogeneous. So I think the first step is really doing that analysis to really determine these people that are most affected and the ones that really need the support. Because we can, for instance, say informal sector. So the question is who in that informal sector? They're not at the same level. Some of the issues, some of the restrictions they faced are different, for instance, we can say, you no, know, maybe the agricultural sector or the manufacturing sector was open as it was in central services in most countries. Despite that, you found that 
those that are really at the lower ranks that are daily employees, the ones that depend on daily wages might have been laid off, even if these are sectors that were deemed as um, economically viable. So really that analysis is very relevant to know how you're segmenting the support and who needs what part of support. Based on the analysis, the next step is really thinking about these people. What are some, some of those services that they access? What are those some of those private sector infrastructure or service providers they're registered with? So banks, telecommunication companies, other NGO programs, those are all opportunities to capture those people that are left out, okay? Also, another important aspect is the self-targeting. So if you identify your categories very clearly, there's that opportunity. If I self-identify, for instance, if you go categorical and say, I want to capture all widows or persons above the age of 60 or persons working in this particular sector or that sector, that is that self-identification. But there's still need for verification or even in terms of... Uh, of the self-identification. But the important thing is not just to build that particular register for this response, but looking forward, if that register is built, that work is done to identify these people, how are they transitioned into mainstream systems? How are they linked to ongoing initiatives to create IDs and, uh, and actually a registration, vital registration system? So if they're identified and provided with support, they need to be linked to mainstream systems and beyond that, what do we see uh, in terms of social protection? So if we're providing COVID-19 relief now, what happens to them maybe once um, the impacts are dampened? How do we move them into some more structured support? In terms of people that talk about sex social security schemes, because that's an important area for the informal sector. So these people, what social security schemes are there for? Women, for instance, we extend maternity protection to maybe domestic workers, is there a insurance scheme, something that they can contribute to, maybe people in construction, people in agriculture. So really designing products beyond just maybe social assistance and also looking at social security and the different things that can, can, really, um, can really capture these particular type of groups and provide with adequate support. And moving forward, I think the next question you asked was around inclusion and particularly disparities for women. So the funny thing about programs is every time I hear people say, oh, we are gender sensitive or we are inclusive, by basically targeting women as recipients, the expectation is that a program becomes sensitive and addresses disparities. But however, that is not the case. So there's really need to look into some of those real social risks. So what are the unique vulnerabilities? What is the differentiated impact of programs on men and women? There are other, I think, programs that really look at these issues in terms of what do they, how do they impact women? How do they impact uh, girls? What exactly is the different considerations that need to be, to be taken into, into account in terms of economic and uh, social, social vulnerabilities? that are different across men and women. So I think there are some programs, for instance, in Ethiopia, we have uh, the PSNP and also in India. So you have like a public work program, but this public works program takes into account the caregiving role that women have. So for instance, since they still have to take care of children in the home, how are they supported with that care role? So these public works offer different schedules for women. They also offer childcare uh, opportunities. So if you're working in the productive safety net program in, in Ethiopia, there's flexible hours. There's also some support, maternity support for pregnant and nursing women. And also really focusing to ensure that you get uh, equal wages and the payment is done. Apart from that, using that program in social protection, not just to give that money and say, there's been improvement in gender dynamics, the PNSP, for instance, has decided to look at women and reduce some of their time poverty. So women have to collect wood, they have to collect water, but really looking at how to use such a program to do community projects that respond to this. So the big important thing is to say that just because a program targets women does not mean that it is gender sensitive. We really need to look at those dynamics and design around those specific vulnerabilities that, uh, that women face. So going forward, I think there are a lot of opportunities. A lot of governments are really on board. A lot of programs being implemented claim to be gender sensitive, 
But the important thing is investing in ensuring that it's not just about delivery of one benefit, but really the complementarities and really addressing those social risks that are unique to women as a particular group, but addressing them and linking that to various sectors. So, yeah, I think that is where I'll end for now. Thank you very much, Ojini. Thank you very much, Sheila. Um, I particularly liked what you said about not having the blankets, gender consciousness in the program, but actually designing programs to particularly address specific vulnerabilities that women face. Um, that's very useful. And we have a lot of policy um, specialists who are signed in. We have some government people. And I think that's a useful consideration that makes it even more practical so that women can equally benefit and assess, um, assess the benefits of these programs you know, that are designed equally. Um, I also like the practical recommendations that you gave and some of the issues that you raised regarding um, identifying the most affected people. It's very important to disaggregate um, if you're saying informal sector. So um, it's good to disaggregate them and find out what sectors actually and what even what groups actually need the um, social assistance more than others. Um, in the course of our discussion today, I believe that some of our panelists will also address those concerns. Um, our next speaker, our next presenter is um, Amanda Serumaga. She will shed some light on what has worked in some African countries. Amanda Serumaga is a development practitioner with over 20 years experience and a multidisciplinary academic profile. She has worked in diverse contexts leading on strategic design and implementation transformational programs across multiple sectors and development contexts. And this includes serving in Sudan, South Sudan, New York, and Kenya. She's conversant with multidimensional poverty and development issues, particularly for marginalized communities. Amanda is the UNDP resident representative for Mauritius and Seychelles. Mauritius is reputed to have extensive social protection programs. Majority of the programs, um, majority of the population is covered by the social assistance programs and citizens receive assistance in the form of free health services, which even extend to complex procedures like surgeries. Citizens also benefit from subsidies on food, um, there's free plan, public transportation for the elderly and physically challenged, as well as contributory and non-contributory social benefits. Amanda, can you please share how the government of Mauritius finances these social protection programs and some of the safeguards put in place to prevent exploitation and overcoverage? My second question to you is focused on the role of NGOs in the implementation of social protection programs in Mauritius. What are some of the emerging areas for attention against the backdrop of the COVID-19 pandemic? Thank you very much. And thanks for giving the overview on Mauritius. I'm, I mean, I think you're in fact right about its reputation for a very broad social welfare scheme. If you'll allow me, I'd like to just share my screen and uh, just give you an overview of the answers to the particular questions that you've raised. Um, I hope you can see the screen now. Let me know. Can you see it? Yes. Okay, thank you. So as has been put forward, you know, the, the issues around uh, the questions that you raised, I'm gonna just go through them very quickly. Um, and uh, I'm trying here to go through this presentation. So the points that I want to raise are number one, uh, the Marshall Plan Against Poverty. So quite some time ago, UNDP began working with the government of Mauritius to develop what was called a Marshall Plan Against Poverty. And this plan allowed the government to anchor a social protection program within the framework of some sort of policy um, imperatives with regard to 
ensuring that those who are being left behind are included. And this program um, has uh, several elements to it. And let me know if you can see side three. So the plan has about 39 actionable and costed proposals and that provide for those, the, you know, the traditional areas of social protection in terms of employment, education, health and empowerment and so on. And the main element of the program is that to establish a contract between citizens and the government around alleviation of poverty and promoting empowerment. Now, since January 2017, um, the program has been operational and it began with um, setting up a social integration and economic empowerment act. Um, after that, uh, we've seen that they've implemented particular conditionalities for the poor to be able to meet minimum sets of behavior, if I can put it that way, in order to benefit from cash transfers. And this is going to become an issue when I answer the last question around the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. So moving on from that, what was there in order to, to, to identify and capture and to deal with the question of leakages that several of my colleagues have spoken to, before there was no social register. Now there is a social register and Prior to that, part of the issues and challenges that were met was that it was costly and complex to manage services to, for people for social protection. Why? Precisely because of problems of targeting, so that there was also a multitude of programs that were managed by various different MDAs, high and under coverage of the poor, uh, a leakage uh, due to the non-poor, and exactly getting back to the point of the need for a national identification system, a lack of relevant data, in other words, linking the poverty imperatives and the programs to some sort of targets around poverty alleviation and reduction and empowerment, and then the subjectivity in terms of deciding who was eligible and who was not. So therefore they set up what they call the social register of Mauritius, and it's a tool to register and identify the poor, their socioeconomic profile to inform policymakers on the effective um, demand for pro poor policies. And what is interesting about this register is that it has these four objectives. I've said about identification, but it's also to take a whole of government approach, being able to bring all the different elements of people. If you put a person at the center, when you can look at their health needs and their educational needs and their, their, their employment needs and all of that and manage social programs in an integrated way. It was also designed to better harmonize the eligibility criteria for the different social programs and to analyze and inform about obviously the poverty reduction policies and these to, to, to the advantage and to the, to the commendation I suppose of the government are linked to actual SDG targets and I suppose before that the MDG targets. So how does it work and just it's a very very quick overview of how it works is that number one, the data, which I think many of you have caught or have spoken to, is linked to the household budget survey. And that will become problematic, you'll hear later on. Then there is a proxy means test. Now the proxy means test covers several elements to decide who's eligible and who's not. So part of it is of course, first of all, the, demograph the demography of a household and of an individual age and age clusters you know, less than three, four to 10 years old, teenagers, elderly, and so on. Then there's also where they live, location, because there will be pockets of poverty and pockets that are underserved. There's, of course, the nature of the dwelling that they live in, detached, um, a semi-detached house, crudely constructed, and so on. And then whether they have access to basic public services like water, electricity, and so on and so forth. And once they've got that economic uh, profile, socioeconomic profile and the demographics on people, then they apply that test to then see whether they are eligible to access the services. Now, so therefore what will be claimed and what we can say is working to a relatively well, good degree is that there's now a unified registry. Uh, there's beneficiaries without duplication, I'll just say less leakage. There's relevant information available for poverty reduction policies and government actually has just tabled their budget about two weeks ago, where they're able to actually identify the number of households eligible, the number of individuals eligible and what they're eligible for. And that helps obviously in that from a fiscal perspective, increases the coverage of the poor 
um, by removing uh, the inefficiencies and of course reduces leakages. Now, in terms of who's working together on all of this, first of all, it operates under the aegis of Ministry of Social Security and the main user is the Ministry of Social Integration and Economic Empowerment, which implements the Marshall Plan Against Poverty. And I should say, this Marshall Plan is actually unpacked year on year, and you hear bits and pieces of it in the national budget, and they come across as programs. And then there's the collaboration, of course, of the Minister of Finance, the Statistics Mauritius, which does the Household Budget Survey, Center on uh, Informatics Bureau, which helps with the, with the messaging to the beneficiaries and using digital technology to contact, to, to, to deploy resources. And UNDP has been working on this for quite some time, so it's about 12 years now. But let me close by just raising some of the issues to answer your second question and to even touch on the issue of, of uh, NGOs. The first thing that we saw with the, with the COVID pandemic was the question about whether this tool is, best, is, is fit for purpose in terms of being a crisis response mechanism. Why? Because as you said, there are a bunch of new poor. There were people losing their jobs. We know also from a gendered perspective, people who work in a certain social income category would be the most likely to lose their jobs. But as I said, if it's attached to the household budget survey that's done only on an annual basis, how were you able to target very specifically the new poor, the newly deprived? The other thing was about identification and inclusion in a crisis setting. Mauritius, uh, we just came out of 72 days of lockdown. And when I say lockdown, I mean total lockdown. So of course, there was a question of being able to reach the poor and to identify where they were domiciling at any one time. Now, thankfully or gratefully, Mauritius is not a very large country, but it did require a large deployment of the social services to be able to reach people. There's also now the question of sustainability. You started off by talking about the wealth of all of the social protection measures that exist in Mauritius. But then this is precisely part of the problem because on the one hand, there is a great uh, availability of social services and social welfare for everybody, whether it's free education up to university level with minimum payments required, whether it's health, whether it's even a flat tax of only 15% for everybody. So the result is with the expansion of need, there was a question as to where, how, how can it be financed? And now we know that as an upper middle income country, Mauritius is not eligible for official development assistance. You can't get money from DFID or USAID or whoever or the EU for this kind of thing. So the question now, and as I said, the budget was presented a couple of um, weeks ago, and we know that there's a large budget deficit at this point in time. So there's going to have to be a rethinking about whether there's a need to contract the general social welfare package in order to be able to sustain and expand this particular social register driven package to take care of those who are being left behind. I want to also just touch on two last points. The other one would, one would be about exit strategies. I talked about the proxy means test. Now the proxy means test allows you to be eligible to social protection. But there is also a social contract which is linked to the Marshall Plan um, for poverty alleviation. And this plan requires, for example, that you ensure your children attend school 90% of the time, that you make sure that you are going to attend 70% of courses that are made available for job empowerment and healthcare, that you're going to be taking part in health um, advisories and so on. Now, the question is, is that if there is a continuous shock and this shock for COVID is anticipated to be even as long as up to 2023, graduation out of this social mechanism, assuming that these elements help you graduate, it means that there's actually a redoubling and a, re, um, a regression of the number of people who would actually be able to move out of this social protection and into regular social welfare. The last thing that I wanted to point out was about exclusion. Um, you may well know that um, Mauritius, like Seychelles, has a very large uh, component of migrant labor. And it was not clear during the COVID times whether these migrant laborers, a lot of them from India and the in Indian subcontinent, whether they were actually eligible for social welfare. 
And let me close by saying that government did establish, as we heard from our colleague Apera in Nigeria, a COVID solidarity fund. And this fund was interesting because it received um, financing, not just from government, but from the private sector, from individuals, you could make contributions via SMS and, and by mobile banking. It received from corporates and so on. But at the same time, as I said, part of the challenges remained identifying and narrowing the beneficiaries to not necessarily everybody who had need, but then to really narrow it down to the issues of gender. We supported, for example, domestic violence shelters, which we know uh, this, this the problem escalated a lot during the, the, the COVID lockdown period, although it is a perennial problem in this country. So just to summarize, I think that the, the, these infrastructures and architectures that are built for social protection, the question becomes whether they're fit for purpose when you experience these kinds of shock. Now, it's not clear whether there'll be another shock, but we, we know that everybody's talking about a second wave. The second point I want to raise is about fiscal space and what happens in upper middle income countries. They're not high income countries, they're not low income countries, but they don't have alternatives. So it might be a question of more taxation. And then the question about exiting and of course exclusions, the people who would not be captured even with the household budget survey and those other elements. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Amanda, for that very useful presentation. It seems with COVID, um, the COVID-19 pandemic, governments all over the world are being forced to rethink their fiscal strategies for financing the social protection because the needs are expanding. And in some countries, of course, the um, revenue is, the revenue is dwindling. But it was very useful. The, I mean, the Mauritius story is inspiring for other countries, African countries in particular, who are um, just starting up with their own social protection policies. There's so much work that we can do. And I'm hopeful that through um, peer learning, the lessons from Mauritius can be used by other countries to develop more nuanced policy interventions. Um, now we come to our next panelist, Mohamed Sani Abdullahi. Mohamed is the Chief of Staff to the Cardinal State Governor. Prior to his current position, Mohamed was the Commissioner for Budget and Planning. He has worked as advisor to the Governor of Cameroon and as policy advisor at the United Nations Secretary General's Office in New York, where he was part of the team that developed the SDGs. Mohammed and I have been friends from our early days at the National Democratic Institute and um, is here today. So Mohammed, as one of the, Kaduna State is known to be one of the most progressive states in Nigeria. What would you say was the level of preparedness of Kaduna State in the face of the COVID pandemic and what steps were taken to mitigate the economic impact on small businesses and the poor? My second question has to do with child poverty and the situation of our Marjorie's who were sent back to their states of origin. The Cardona State Government has handled this situation proactively. Can you please share ways in which Kaduna State is working to reintegrate the Marjorie's into the society? Thank you very much. Um... Um, Odwani, it's really good to see you and to see um, Ada and um, the other panelists. Um, thank you for the invitation to participate in this um, very important conversation. Um, I think that this is, is quite timely. Um, uh, you asked about level of preparedness. Um, I doubt if um, any country in the world was prepared for the shock of the pandemic um, that has happened uh, this year. Um, it's been truly unprecedented um, regarding its impacts and its effects, both from an economic standpoint and a social standpoint. I mean, for governments, I believe the COVID-19 has probably been what could be termed as the worst nightmare of any sitting um, administration um, because uh, it provides a triple threat. Um, it forces policymakers to balance between lives um, livelihoods and liberty of their people. Um, and each of these things is very important and it's very 
um, at the core of what governance um, is actually about. For Nigeria, of course, COVID provided two major threats. Um, the first being the um, health threat that was um, posed by the pandemic of people dying, um, of people overburdening a health system that definitely wasn't ready um, for it. And the second is that um, the pandemic has hit Africa and Nigeria at a time where the region is experiencing modest economic growth. As you know, um, in 2016, Nigeria um, uh, went through a deep recession. Um, we are still recovering from that. We still haven't hit um, 3% growth. We just emerged actually from negative um, growth. So we were just at the point where we were starting to see um, a rainbow, um, um, some light at the end of the tunnel. And now we are back um, hit by low oil prices, low global production, um, a, a, a deeply hurt global economy and the health pandemic, which we have to spend significant amounts of, of money on. So of course, this has created significant fear um, uh, to all governments regarding the uh, fiscal space um, that it has to not only deliver other programs and projects, but also to protect uh, the lives of its people and also to protect the most vulnerable in its societies. So it has the effect of exacerbating our fiscal deficits. It is definitely distorting growth and it is exacerbating um, inequality. And this is of huge concern uh, to all of us. Um, back to Kaduna, I think for, for, for listeners that aren't from Nigeria, Kaduna um, is a state in, in, in Nigeria, um, about two and a half hours away from the capital. We have about 10 million people here. And the recent reports from our, the National Bureau of Statistics puts Kaduna at 43% um, poor, uh, meaning that we have at least uh, almost 5 million people that are living below a dollar um, a day. Uh, not only that, um, we also have a huge informal sector. Uh, about 60% of, of the state um, is engaged in the informal sector. So this um, pandemic really put um, a huge um, uh, problem before us because uh, the first response to the pandemic globally has been to lockdown. Now, what lockdown actually means is to uh, halt all uh, ongoing economic activity um, uh, in a way that affects the informal sector uh, the most because the informal sector um, is driven by uh, people who survive basically almost on a day-to-day -day, um, basis, who have limited um, uh, savings capacity, who work um, in a way that is not sufficiently covered uh, by formal arrangements. Unlike in the West um, uh, of the globe, the informal economy in Africa, in Nigeria, and in Kaduna is not a marginal phenomenon. It's a space where there's a majority of working uh, men and women who sustain themselves um, on a daily basis. And so um, these include, you know, farmers in the agricultural sector, transport workers, uh, laborers, traders across urban, peri-urban um, and rural areas. You know, so of course, Kaduna also um, joined at the beginning of the, uh, we've just actually emerged from our um, 60, over 60 days of lockdown. And this has had, of course, um, its own uh, significant negative effects on, on the livelihoods of people that live in these um, sectors. So we were forced um, to sit down right at the beginning of the pandemic to really look at how do we cater um, for the poorest amongst our people, for the people that do not have the incomes uh, to be able to stay locked in for a day, two days, um, talk less of um, 60 um, uh, days. And you know, we, we realized uh, at the time um, of the dire requirement for a proper um, social protection uh, program in a way that hasn't existed uh, before. I think my colleague at the national level has spoken about the um, register that is currently being developed um, uh, across Nigeria. However, for Kaduna, uh, this register only at the beginning of the pandemic only had 90,000 people on it. Um, 90,000 out of 10 million um, residents 
are captured on the register. Um, if we're looking at 5 million that are poor, then this is 90,000 out of, of, of 5 million, right? Or 4.3 million. Um, so we invested uh, quickly um, using state's resources, um, but this takes time, especially you cannot register new people uh, during the lockdown as well, because you're also uh, scared that the people that go out on registration duties are also possible carriers of the COVID um, virus. So it's been difficult, but we've been able to beef up this database to about 130,000 um, uh, people today. So we immediately started a round of what has been properly tagged in Nigeria as the distribution of, of palliatives, uh, which is food items um, or various social support uh, to targeted communities where we think uh, we have vulnerable uh, people. So in the first round of the palliatives, we had gathered significant amounts of food um, and some resources to, be, to distribute to areas where we thought would be most affected. But when we sat down, um, the first thing that came out was really a dearth of data, uh, lack of identity. Um, who do you actually target? Who do you provide these um, uh, palliatives to? How do you ensure that it is not a politically um, uh, motivated distribution, but that these things actually go to um, who they're supposed to get to? And we had a huge problem. And so the first round of the palliative distribution really did not go um, the way that we planned. Um, uh, there was wrong targeting. Um, uh, th at the end of the day, the people that we thought um, should have received this um, uh, support from the government didn't. So we came back to the drawing board and tried to really look at how do we target? Um, how do we uh, expedite the creation of a register? How do we ensure that we're identifying households? And we picked up on a few things. Uh, firstly, the uh, state has been doing um, household surveys almost on an annual basis, which identifies our poorest local governments, our poorest wards. But these do not go as far as identifying individuals. Secondly, we picked on the 90,000 from the social register, which were already receiving some support uh, from the federal government. And third, we then tried to use telco data to identify, we worked with the National Communications Commission, a few of our telcos, to get the database of um, individuals within the state that had mobile phones and that had low recharge amounts to use as a proxy to identify the poor. Now that had a few challenges. Number one is that you're only targeting people that own phones um, at the first instance, and secondly, people that live in areas where there's mobile coverage. So we tried to create a composite index uh, with these three sources of data, and then to retarget the distribution of palliatives in that um, second round. And this has gone a bit better. We were able to reach 30,000 houses, but still not scratching the surface. So really what it has revealed to us is the huge gap that we have in terms of supporting our people. So we've sat down now, we have a, a dedicated social investment team that's looked at all the various support systems that we provide. We have a, 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 a program that's ongoing with the Ministry of um, Human Services and Social Development that really has been a model to supporting women, right? We have another program uh, that looks at nutrition and really looking at children, uh, school going age and, and all of that uh, part. We have a contributory pension scheme which supports the, the elderly part of our population. We have a contributory health scheme. But these are not coherently brought together under an umbrella that we can term um, really social protection. Uh, so we don't have really what you would call a robust um, social protection program. This is something that the pandemic has revealed. And it's something that we're really trying to work on now very, very quickly um, uh, on all sides to see, including legislations that need to be uh, that need to be done. We've got them scattered about, but it's not um, holistic in a way that we would um, term really a robust social protection uh, program. So uh, the social investment program in Kaduna was tasked to create this um, uh, protection policy, which a draft has now been made available that has gone through extensive rounds of, um, of commentary from the people um, to really come up with something that's strong based on an identity management um, system which we're building that has over 2 million residents today, working together with the national uh, program. So this is um, a work in, in progress. Now a subset of the most vulnerable population in Kaduna is, as you have termed, um, uh, uh, Odueni, the Almajiris. Um, these are usually young, um, 
boys usually even though recently we've discovered that even girls have been engaged in the system who are sent across the state uh, and across Nigeria for Islamic education. And we found that these uh, groups are very vulnerable. A number of them uh, stand the risk of rape, um, stand the risk of all manner of social, social ills by virtue of not being under um, uh, the, the connection of a family, without the love of a family, without education. And so we've really, uh, the governor has felt very strongly about this and has discussed and led his other colleagues now to put an end to the Almajiri system um, uh, uh, using this time. Now the COVID pandemic allowed us to identify where they actually live. Because when the city is open completely, it's impossible to identify where these Almajiris are located because they're very mobile, they hide from the law, but the pandemic kept them all in one place and we're able to identify their malams, uh, who are the ones that, uh, that, that lead them, and also be able to then separate the ones that are not from Kaduna or not resident in Kaduna and send them back to their states as part of an agreement with the northern uh, governors and then retain the ones that we have. And now we've criminalized uh, the system and are forcing them into formal um, education systems. And as I said, we're working on a robust uh, way to ensure that these families uh, are supported in a way that they don't have to send their children um, out um, uh, to bed. So in a, in a nutshell, these are some of the issues that we're, we're raising. Um, this topic is very important for us. We've been taking copious notes. I have a few of my colleagues on the call and we want to be able to follow up uh, with colleagues that are doing really important things in this area so that we can move fast and create a robust social protection system for the state. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mohammed. Um, the last statement about taking notes and um, learning from other colleagues, that was one of the reasons why we put together this dialogue because we hope that it would encourage a lot of peer learning among practitioners in the social protection space so that lessons and experiences from other countries can also be replicated. Um, I found the um, innovative approaches being employed by Kaduna states really um, interesting and inspiring, um, particularly this, um, every, all the presenters, um, your feedback and your answer to the questions has shown that the importance of data cannot be overemphasized. Data, um, disaggregated data is crucial if the um, all vulnerable are to be reached and if extensive coverage of um, social perception is to be expanded. Um, like Mohammed said, there's a lot of work to be done the surface has barely been scratched, but definitely um, there's been some progress made and it's also still a work in progress. Um, we're, we are almost one hour into this webinar. Um, so I'd like the final speaker to make his presentation so that we would have time to take um, questions and answers. I can see that a lot of questions have been um, Post that using the question and answer box. Thank you very much, Mohammed. So I'll now come to our final speaker, um, Ashu Handa. Ashu Handa is a trained economist specializing in poverty and human capital in developing countries. He is a Kenan eminent professor of public policy at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He is one of the principal investigators of the multi country research initiative on the impact of national cash transfer programs on households and children. This initiative is led by the UNICEF and he has led and been part of large scale impact evaluations of national cash transfer programs in Ghana, Malawi, Zambia, Kenya and Zimbabwe. He um, is going to address a question that often comes up in the debate on social protection. There are several schools of thoughts who argue that social safety nets in general will undermine the resilience of the average African who's known to survive against all odds. Handa, in your experience, what model of social assistance do you think is the best fit for African countries keen to provide social safety nets for their citizens without encouraging free rider behavior or over-dependence on social assistance? In addition, how would you advise governments like we've overemphasized during this, um, we've talked and talked about during this 
webinar, governments with weak identity management systems and low financial inclusion indices to expand social protection coverage, especially cash transfers. Thank you very much for inviting me. And you can see that I indeed have been asking some questions because I've been learning quite a lot from the other panelists. So it's really a pleasure to be here. And apparently Sheila and I go back some time from Zambia days. Thanks for reminding me, Sheila. I'm going to share uh, my screen with a few slides. Um, let me know if um, it is working. Do you see? Do you see my screen? Yes. So I'm part of um, the transfer project. You can see the logo here in the bottom right. And we are uh, a research and policy kind of policy advocacy uh, initiative. It's led by UNICEF in collaboration with uh, the FAO in Rome and uh, the University of North Carolina where I'm based. Um, and, and we, um, our goal has been to really build the evidence base on the impacts of cash transfer programs uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa, focused on working with governments. So uh, we have been engaged in over a dozen impact evaluations of government cash transfer programs. And so what I thought I would do is give you a kind of overview of some of the, the key results that we found um, over these countries, right? Um, and then address some of the issues. So, you know, very briefly, let me, um, this is the opening slide actually. So what I kind of wanted to make sure that everyone was um, aware of is just the extent to which cash transfers are actually part of government um, policy throughout Sub-Saharan Africa, right? Um, I'm not sure who the audience is and what their knowledge, previous knowledge is of social protection cash transfers, but so just to remind us that when we talk about cash transfers, we're talking about um, a kind of regular, predictable transfer of cash, right? Either monthly or bi-monthly to a particular target group, right? And Sheila mentioned you could have categorical Others have mentioned poverty targeting as in Mauritius and so on, right? So there are different ways of targeting. Uh, so these should not be confused with like one-off grants, you know, that are maybe tied to entrepreneurship and other things. There is some confusion about what a cash transfer is, but what everyone here has been talking about is kind of this regular income support that's provided over a period of time to particular groups. Um, cash transfers reach over a billion people across the world um, and in sub-Saharan Africa as you can see here um, we estimate that about 70 over 70 million people um, are reached by government programs now and that number is growing every day even as we speak and we've heard the Nigerian experience and the Mauritius experience even as we speak this number is growing right um, and almost every country government has a cash transfer program now. We have amassed a considerable amount of evidence, which I'd like to share just a quick overview of with you. Um, but these systems, these programs typically, um, as I mentioned, target on some kind of vulnerability criteria. We've heard of some of the criteria here, including, you know, orphans or vulnerable children like the Ghana LEAP program or the Kenya or Botswana or Namibia programs. Um, in Southern Africa, obviously, orphans in OVC is a big driver of cash transfers because of HIV AIDS. The typical programs, um, and this is what we want to get to in terms of financial inclusion, are what we call uh, use pull systems rather than push systems for payment. So pull means that beneficiaries are brought to a pay point and they are then paid their money in cash, which speaks directly to the issue of whether that can be made more efficient, right, by um, enabling financial inclusion and allowing e-payments. We'll talk about that in a second. The typical, just to give you an idea, the typical transfer size can range between 
10 to $20 uh, per household per month. Uh, the structure could be either like a flat transfer as it is like in Zambia or Kenya. Um, so the household basically gets a flat amount, let's say $15 per month, or in many countries, the transfer value is tied to the size of the household and then usually there's a cap, right? Um, so those are, that's for example, um, uh, in um, Mozambique, there's a transfer that's staggered. In Malawi, the transfer is staggered by household size and so on. Um, and we've seen really a rapid expansion of these programs in the last decade. And these are some of the countries that have really increased rapidly the proportion of the population covered by cash transfer programs. Uh, I put up this, I didn't know that uh, Sheila was gonna be with us today, but I put up this uh, photo anyway, because I think it kind of illustrates the, the mindset that's kind of slowly changing in Sub-Saharan Africa, right? Whereas you can see that in this presidential campaign in 2016, uh, the incumbent, um, Edgar Lungu, actually campaigned on a platform that included social protection and a promise to expand the cash transfer program if he was elected. And in fact, he was elected. And in fact, he did increase the national budget to, cash tra to the cash transfer and expanded it tremendously. So it's interesting because, um, you know, on the one hand, um, there is this idea that maybe cash transfers undermines like traditional kind of systems and so on. But there's also this very, I think, growing political current now that recognizes that the traditional systems are breaking down, people are moving, the, the ties that connect families, you know, that are in the, in the, you know, traditional kind of village setting are breaking down. And kind of more cynically maybe that these are, this is also a way to buy votes, right? To get people on board with your agenda. So I thought that this is kind of a nice symbolic photo about the thinking that's, that's going on now. Let me show you some evidence. Uh, what I'll draw on is stuff that we published in this book, um, which uh, summarizes the evidence across eight countries, okay? And this is kind of just the highlights. We have very little time, right? So uh, these are the kind of overarching highlights. And so the green, you know, across eight countries based on rigorous evaluations, usually randomized controlled trials, as we did in Zambia with Sheila. Um, so the green indicates that across these countries, we see very strong positive impacts in these areas, right? So for example, food security, uh, subjective well-being, productive activity. This entails purchasing more livestock, um, buying more fertilizer or high yielding seeds, uh, moving from say staples into some cash cropping, right? Um, we see strong impacts on schooling, spending on school supplies such as uniforms and shoes. Um, and we see a pretty, uh, you know, significant um, consistent effect on reduced illness, right? We also do not see any increase in alcohol or tobacco use. That's always a concern that's brought up, right? Will people waste this money? Um, and you also see somewhat weaker results on children's nutritional status and on care-seeking behavior and health, okay? So this is an area, this is a remaining challenge. And here I think uh, many countries are now trying to link the cash transfer programs more closely with the health infrastructure, particularly on young child nutrition. So there are some strong initiatives in, um, in Kenya and Ghana where they're making efforts to link beneficiaries with the nutrition, with nutrition programs to address the fact that there's still some work to do in terms of child nutrition status. So this is kind of an overview just to say the evidence is extremely positive, keeping an eye on the time. Um, I wanted to just mention one other very important finding, which is that um, we did what we call these local economy effects, where you can kind of model, you know, what happens when you inject, when you have a cash transfer that goes into a village, 
obviously not just the beneficiary will benefit because they will buy things from the local shops and so on, right? And so you can imagine that there's this like macroeconomic effect, a spillover or multiplier effect on the local economy. And we estimated these and you can see these spillover effects, right? That in fact, every say dollar, right? Or, you know, CD or Quacha that's transferred into a village actually generates additional benefits to others in the village, right? And so for example, we take Zambia. So every Quacha that's injected into the village via the cash transfer actually is generating an additional, you can see 0.7 Quacha multiplier. And these are basically like the increased profits to shopkeepers and others who are providing services and goods to the recipients of the cash transfer, right? This is like a, a Keynesian effect. Lesotho, which is a rather closed economy, the multiplier effect is even larger, right? Zimbabwe, Ethiopia. So this is quite exciting for the ministers of finance, right? And the presidency, because they understand that there's actually a connection between um, supporting social protection and economic growth. It's not necessarily an either or, but actually, you know, this can also help others in the econ in the local economy and grow the local economy. So that's an important result. So now going to the questions in particular. So just to give people a sense of the challenges, right? So these are the payments. This is the payment mechanism and the actual payday. Uh, this is the, the social cash transfer program in Malawi, and this is in the Ghana program. And you can see what's happening, right? People are by and large illiterate. So you could see that um, rather than, you know, you have to have a thumbprint rather than signing, that people are paid in cash because they tend to be unbanked or there are no banks in the areas where they are living. Um, and you could see here in the background, here, let me, uh, this is a maybe better example. This is in Malawi. So again, you see that we're sitting under a tree in the village. People are lined up. They have their kind of identity card and uh, they are coming here. They're showing their kind of identity card. They'll stamp their thumb and they'll get their cash, right? And we call this a pull system, right? It's pulling people in. And, you know, the system is designed because people are unbanked and they tend to be by and large illiterate as well. And so they, you know, in South Africa has moved to a more e-payments, more people are banked, but in the rural areas, they're still paying in cash. Um, other countries have been experimenting with this, but it remains a major, major challenge. And so, um, you know, I don't know that I have a, a solution. Uh, we know that con some countries are piloting in particular districts, mechanisms, to, um, to have e-payments, but it remains very difficult because of the type of population that we're dealing with. So I, I don't, you know, as, as we move to maybe peri-urban areas and urban areas, people, more people may be banked. It may be a little bit more feasible to think about, you know, transfers via cell phone. Um, but even the transfer via cell phone, you have to negotiate the fees with the cell phone companies and it, it, there are some bureaucratic and administrative and quite frankly financial challenges with that that have led that still remain, you know, act as barriers to the efficient payment systems, right? Um, so the other thing that's very important to understand is that these pull systems provide a very important opportunity to link beneficiaries with other services. So, you know, Amanda talked about the Mauritius kind of conditional cash transfer. And if you read her response in the chat, she talks about how, you know, there are these other services that they want to provide to beneficiaries. And if you have a pull, sys a, a pull system, then it's very easy to do that. So in Malawi, Zimbabwe, they take advantage of the payday, the pay parade it's called in Malawi, to have other service providers there interacting with beneficiaries, right? If you have a push system, you lose that contact. So you may gain something in efficiency, but you may lose something in terms of the case management and the more comprehensive and holistic type of intervention that you know, many families need, right? Because 
their problems go beyond just cash, obviously. Um, so I just wanted to lay that out there as something that I think is worth thinking about. Um, I think I've gone over my 10 minutes, so I'll stop here. And if there are any questions, we can take that up. Thank you. I'll stop sharing. Thank you very much, Handa. Thank you for sharing empirical evidence on the impacts of cash transfers and for driving home the point that providing cash transfers to the poor and vulnerable don't necessarily make them over dependent. Instead, actually, they help them have more choices in terms of catering to their basic needs. And um, also it injects money into the local economy for those small businesses that service these core households. And regarding the um, question of financial inclusion, it seems that um, that might be a good opportunity for collaboration, for governments to collaborate with the private sector, particularly financial institutions, perhaps provide some incentive for them to begin to explore ways in which they can increase the coverage of financial services to those in, um, or in these low income communities, because it's you know, a real problem in a lot of villages there are hardly any banks and the cost of even transacting, going to town to withdraw cash and oh, oh is it's a hindrance, it's a deterrent for a lot of uh, people from low income households. Um, so we come to the end of the presentation section. Thank you very much everyone. It has been very enlightening. There are a lot of questions also um, that have come in. So let's quickly dive into the Q&A session. Um, questions directed at you. And I'd like you to take one minute to respond to the questions. We have 12 minutes left before the, this webinar closes. So I'll take the first question directed at Mohammed. What plan is Kaduna State? This question is from Iman Odanjuma. He says, what plan is Kaduna State having in place for linking social protection in enterprise development beyond the cash transfers? We'd focus on about 5 million poor in the state. I'm not sure. We understand this question, but Mohammed, should I read the question again? I'm not yes, sure. please. Don't read it. Yeah. If you can read this again. Okay, I think he's asking what other plans Kaduna State has in linking social protection to enterprise development beyond conditional okay. conditions. Okay, thank you very much. I think in the draft policy that we're looking at now and about to formalize, we look majorly at, um, at four broad measures um, to deliver and coordinate our social protection um, uh, promises. Uh, the first is protective, um, which looks at how to protect the vulnerable and poor households, um, their incomes um, and the consumption methodologies through non-contributory social assistance programs like cash transfers, school feeding, fee waivers, you know, other interventions that reduce the barriers to accessing um, basic social services like health, education, uh, water and sanitation. The second um, group of measures are preventative, which look at things that prevent um, individuals and groups from falling into poverty due to shocks like we have seen um, now. So contributory social insurance schemes that guarantee incomes, health insurance schemes, pensions um, and all of that. I think the question looks at the third measure, which is promotive measure. So promoting the ability of vulnerable households to engage in productive and profitable activities. So looking at how we need to um, boost their livelihoods um, through empowerment schemes, public works programs, agricultural inputs, because, uh, because of the budget constraints that we have, um, it's going to be very difficult to roll out um, a supportive um, 
measure forever. We need to be able to look at how do we provide capacity um, to these vulnerable groups to be able to climb the social ladder and exit um, uh, deep poverty. And this is by economic activities. And it involves capacity programs, um, small loan programs, subsidies, you know, all these things that allow them to start earning incomes and work their way up the ladder so they get off um, social uh, protection. So uh, these are some of the major issues. And the last one is the transformative um, measures where we look at um, addressing social norms uh, and practices that sort of fuel um, inequality and discrimination. So these are more sort of long-term issues around legislation, raising awareness and, and other issues like that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mohammed. Um, I'll take, I think this question is addressed to Handa. Is there any evidence that cash transfers are more efficient and effective than food palliatives? Yeah, very much so. There have been several, I think there have been about two like very rigorous head-to-head -head comparisons of food versus cash. One of them was in Ethiopia, uh, one of them was in Ecuador, one from Latin America and one from Sub-Saharan Africa. I think Mali maybe. Um, but the head-to-head -head shows that in terms of the cost effect, so there are two things. One is if you're giving food, then you kind of have to look at food as the outcome, right? So in terms of the cost effectiveness, the cash is really an order of magnitude more cost effective in terms of just transporting, you know, getting food out there versus the cash, right? The other part of that is when you give food, you are really narrowing people's choice to just food. Whereas if you give cash, you know, as I showed you in that screen, you have, you can get these enormous effects across the household, right? Schooling, you know, morbidity, subjective well-being, productive effects. So giving food is very narrow in the sense that you're really targeting one specific thing. Yes, it's important, but the, you know, the needs of households are actually quite complex and it's up to the household to figure that out, we feel, right? So I would say the evidence is pretty good. And even the World Food Program has now started seriously um, looking at ways to give cash instead of food in certain crisis situations, acknowledging this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Handa. Um, Sheila, this question is um, from Modashola Balogu. She asks, how can social protection programs cover disability related costs for persons with disabilities, especially in the pandemic, since most of them are at higher risk of losing their means of livelihood? Okay, thank you very much uh, for that question. Indeed, I think uh, inclusion is a very critical aspect of any response currently. We find that a lot of these very vulnerable and excluded groups face additional vulnerabilities. And I think one such group is persons with disabilities. I think an opportunity here is not just a question of uh, providing cash transfers. The other considerations that government should take into account is this transfer analysis. Okay? I think we need to be thinking about that. So I, I find that in most responses, because it's important to piggyback or build on existing uh, programs, there's been a move to sort of extend some of the uh, programs that are already in place and really use those transfer values. But what you would discover is that with this huge shock, the COVID-19 in particular, there has been really changes in what that transfer, whatever transfer the different governments are providing can actually meet, what needs it can meet. So I think a key investment overall is just the transfer value, but this transfer value should also be related to different vulnerabilities faced by different groups. So for instance, uh, a transfer value that can be provided to a person who has other sources or doesn't have the cost that a person with disabilities has should be uh, different. So the first step, I think, point of call would be a transfer value, but a differentiated one to really see what are those needs? What can this particular transfer we're giving to this person cover? So that is a very critical point. At the moment, I think across different countries and experiences, it's just a move to scale up, which I understand because looking at also the fiscal space challenges, most uh, governments prefer just to scale up. But if we are really going to meet the needs of the excluded, particularly the disabled, 
uh, women and maybe larger households, they need to actually look at the transfer value and what is the impact of that value in the household. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sheila. Um, I have a question for Apera. So it's from Jackson. He says, I wish to encourage governments to integrate social, national social protection with patient support programs to help patients with terminal illnesses and rare disease to afford essential supplies for their survival. COVID-19 has rendered patients with comorbidities more vulnerable. Um, okay, thank you very much. Um, as part of the efforts for developing the rapid response register, we are also considering not doing uh, categorical targeting. And this will ensure that um, a number of vulnerable groups uh, are, are targeted deliberately to bringing them onto the rapid response register for possible intervention. Um, and also um, the C NCDC um, discussions within the PDF are sort of mapping out the LGAs that are worst hit by the, and, and, um, by the pandemic. Uh, we're calling them the 20 most hit LGAs across the country. These LGAs will be targeted first in terms of trying to rapidly um, register uh, the vulnerable on this, uh, social, uh, this rapid response register for possible intervention. Um, that said, let me also say here that the rapid response register would and the uh, request by government is to expand the current cash transfer to target three, 2 million uh, households on the rapid response register with cash transfer. That means we're expanding the existing, this current cash transfer that is uh, funded by the World Bank credit to target 20, uh, 2 million uh, households or individuals on the rapid response register that is targeting primarily the urban poor. The government itself, it's also through uh, the budget and the, the monies from the PTF targeting another 1 million, that's 3 million. And of course, there are other MDS, including FAO, ILO, and others that are talking through the UN Basket Fund to also target additional people through uh, the Rapid Response Register. So, so that said, I'm on to the other question. Here to slide into poverty, uh, we have uh, the Rapid Response Register, including um, categorical targeting. That will target specific vulnerable groups like people are living with. I hope you got me. Yeah, we just Hello? I'm back on. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, so I was saying um, we're doing categorical targeting for the rapid response register. We are also employing, of course, the use of existing databases, including telcos, uh, banks, ETC. Uh, we are also going to do the phoning where uh, those who have slid into poverty or who consider poor and vulnerable could also, via phones or walk-in centers, register onto the social register. And like Amanda said, in Nigeria also applied the PM, PMT. And we're using the NLSS uh, results that were recently uh, released to recalibrate or recalculate the PMT equation that will be applied to categorize this, those who will be onto this register for various uh, social benefits. To also answer the question, um, um, like uh, Handa said, um, a lot of uh, organizations, governments globally are looking more towards cash transfer as immediate stimulus to bringing people back on their feet, especially the uh, informal sector. It is no different from Nigeria. Um, I mentioned before that through the World Bank Assisted Credit, the National Social Safety Net Program, NAPS, which currently has the capacity of reaching 2 million Nigerians by spending about 800,000 now has just to be in the discussions are on to extend that to another 2 million. So in total, 4 million and other avenues of uh, cash transfer because 
cash transfer provides immediate stimulus to sort of revamping the economy uh, through the poor and vulnerable. And just before I go, I will also say, uh, Mohammed, that I'm happy to say the uh, Kaduna Register has moved from 90,000 uh, poor and vulnerable households to 130,000 poor and vulnerable households at the moment made up of 500,000 individuals. And um, also thanks to your governor who has injected over 30 million naira to the Kaduna State uh, uh, State Operations Coordinating Unit under the Ministry of Planning to then extend the social register beyond the current nine local governments to cover the, all the other local governments in the state. They just finished their training today. I received her report today actually telling me that they have extended training to the other LGAs to continue data capture. So I'm very sure uh, in the next uh, couple of weeks or months, uh, you will have your numbers uh, increase beyond those nine LGAs. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Apera. Well done, Kaduna States. Uh, we hope other states can also grow relief from Kaduna. We've come to the end of um, this webinar. We want to thank everyone very much for sticking with us. Um, there are so many more questions, but the time is short. Um, we'll be in touch. Follow us on our social media channels. Um, if you have any more questions, contact us. We'll reach um, the panelists on your behalf and have your questions answered. Um, in the coming weeks, we have an interesting lineup of digital content and online dialogue. Our next webinar will be on the role of Africa's diaspora in Africa's development, one community at a time. We tentatively slated it for June 25th, and we have an interesting lineup of panelists from governments, academia, and of course the diaspora. If you registered with your email for this webinar, we'll send you more details about this upcoming event. As usual, a replay of this webinar will be sent to your email along with a summary of the key points that were discussed. So on behalf of African Studies Center at the UNC Chapel Hill, UNDP Africa, Adal Noah, my ID, IDEF Africa partner and co-founder, who's in the background making things work like magic, I say thank you, thank you very much, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Bye-bye.